Can you hear me at the back? Yeah? Good. This is bound to fall off at some point. Um, okay, so I'm going to begin this discussion today, this talk, with the complete opposite of what I do when I go to the pub. When I go to the pub, I usually may have to make a lot of apologies at the end. Today I'm going to make apologies at the beginning instead. So I apologize first of all because this discussion and the poster that's in the presentation out there are both shameless plugs for a book I have coming out at the end of October called The Reemergence of Virtual Reality. This is chapter, roughly a bit of chapter one and chapter four of that book and the poster next door is, sorry, chapter five, poster next door is chapter four. I also apologize because this entire day has been an incredibly positive experience. We've had a lot of people coming along and giving great indications of positive uses of virtual reality in higher education, and it's been fantastic. I've learned a lot, and I've got a lot of great ideas. And here comes the person from cultural studies and cultural theory to say, hang on a minute, there's some problems here as well. Let's think about theory for a second and how we do it. So I apologize in advance. I'm the guy who spoils everything, but never mind. It's the end of the day. You can ignore me to a certain extent. So I want to start roughly where our keynote started this morning by talking about the second wave of virtual reality in the late 80s and early 90s and what kind of promise virtual reality had as a technology in its second wave. If the first wave was in the 60s with Ivan Sutherland and his machines, the second wave was characterized in the 1980s by developments by Jaron Lanier et al. at um, VPL company in New York. Now, the promise of VR in the 1980s and 1990s was very straightforward, and it had a discourse wrapped around it, which at that time was extremely seductive and promised great things, not just for education, but all across the spectrum, particularly in uh, entertainment. We had a kind of techno-utopian view of what virtual reality was going to achieve, and it was every bit as hyped in the 1990s, particularly in the early 1990s, as the internet was. It was part of this techno-utopian mix of the period, where you had a countercultural view of, as Timothy Leary once said, virtual reality was going to be like LSD for entertainment, and we're going to have a different perception of the world altogether and a way of making huge amounts of money because Silicon Valley doesn't invest in things unless money was going to happen. Now, that techno-utopianism of the 90s crashed around 2000 with a dot-com burst of 2000, which brought an end, really, to any kind of investment in virtual reality at that stage, and a bit of realism around virtual reality as well. That the vision of virtual reality in the 1980s and 1990s did not meet the technological realities of that time. What was promised and what was wanted could not be delivered by the technology that was available. In the late 2010s, we don't have this issue. We now have reached a stage of technological maturity where we can start to reach some of these aims of the 1980s and 90s. But it's necessary at that point to go back and think, well, what exactly was promised at that time? What is the thing about virtual reality which is so exciting? What is the revolutionary potential of this technology exactly, of this medium? And the revolutionary potential of virtual reality was always around the two ideas that it is radically immersive and radically intimate. The second part is the pit that's often left out when we think about virtual reality. Immersion, and I've got a poster about immersion outside, and the elements that go to make up immersion. Immersion is almost thought of as a given in virtual reality. You put a headset on, you're in it, you're there. Well, it's not actually quite that straightforward as my poster uh, indicates. There are five different elements to immersion, which all work as an assemblage with one another, and they work off one another, and immersion levels vary because of the trade-offs that you make between these different elements. Intimacy is one which we often don't think of, the, uh, and we're not quite there yet with this technology and this wave of virtual reality technology, that we can be there with other people. And we're still coming to terms with that, although I hope we're being successful today with Sansa, and some people are being there with other people and are not listening to what I'm saying right now. Okay, the virtual reality revolution in the 1980s and 1990s, and to an extent today, 
is all about this potential of being in another world. You have a three-dimensional world where you put somebody inside that world, not outside, not as a viewer, not as a passive God-like figure looking down, but embodied within. That's really what we've been talking about today. So the gentleman who just went before me, you put your students in a position where they were manipulating virtual elements in order to create a new design paradigm, right? You, they were there, as far as they're concerned. When they're actually experiencing it, they're there. Yeah? Even if the there is not there, and that's getting into all sorts of philosophical uses of languages I don't want to get into at this point. This is still the potential for virtual reality today. This is what we're trying to do. This is what everyone today really, to a greater or lesser extent, has been talking about. They want to put students somewhere where it's going to help them learn. What you, you can put people in a place where learning is going to happen and it's going to be superior to what we can offer in other ways. This is, why else would we do it? So the potential is still the same. Unfortunately, there are still barriers to that potential. But the potential as being revolutionary is obviously really, really important. It's very exciting for higher education, this moment. Virtual reality is with us. We've got all sorts of potentials to do. It's also it's very exciting for us as academics. We're told to have blended learning in every session. Yes, virtual reality, blended learning, outstanding. You know, we've got TEF to worry about. We're using virtual reality, TEF. Come on. TEF's going to go nuts. That's an instant gold award, you know, if you're using such cutting edge stuff. So, we can even have the ultimate flipped classroom where you can have classes where people don't go to class, which solves so many of my problems because media studies students have some kind of aversion to classes as they go forwards. So to take the class and move it somewhere else, that's the dream. What does VR offer us the potential of doing? And we've seen, I think, instances of this all day today. Experiencing environments that cannot be accessed ordinarily. We can go to places that we wouldn't be able to go to. Recreating dangerous or ethically questionable environments. We've seen examples of that. Exploring design and innovation in virtual ways. Manipulating elements of objects or structures in a way that reinterpret or deconstruct them educationally. I think the gents' presentation previously was a great illustration of that. Offering new perspectives based on a first-person viewpoint in that perspective. We've seen a few examples of that today. So all the potentials of virtual reality are all based in this notion that we can be there, and it offers us a different perspective and something that we couldn't experience in any other way. Fabulous. I have no argument, really, with the potential part. What I do have arguments with, and this isn't necessarily my argument, this has come out of my research that was conducted this time last year uh, with one of my research participants in the room at the moment. I've got to be careful about what I, too, how much I say about it. But this research was done this time last year in Brighton through the Digital Catapult Immersive Lab and through partners of that lab in Brighton. And what the research that I did, with, largely with people who make commercial virtual reality experiences and are in the commercial side of virtual reality, is identify five distinct barriers to the use of virtual reality today. What, and things that are stopping people from jumping on board. And what I'm going to try to do for the remainder of this talk is to recontextualize those barriers a little in terms of HE and educational context. These were the five barriers that were identified by my participants. Not my work. I am just interpreting what I was told in a series of 21 interviews. The materiality of VR is very important, and I'll come to that first. The interfaces we use in virtual reality are a potential problem. The languages and discourses of virtual reality are a distinct issue. The issue of cyber sickness, which hasn't been touched upon too much today, surprisingly, and the cost of virtual reality systems, which has been talked around in different sessions also. Some of these are going to seem a little odd. 
And this is all rooted in critical theory, so I do apologize. Materiality, you might think, okay, this point, this guy is talking nonsense. We're talking about virtual reality. Where is the materiality aspect of something which doesn't exist and by very definition is virtual? Well, obviously VR is a medium that deals with virtual and because we are talking about artificially generated environments. However, all virtual reality is undoubtedly material at the same time. I'm not going to break these. <laughs> Just as a simple example, that's a thing. Now, if I was to throw it really hard on the floor, you'd hear a sound. It's made of stuff. This isn't virtual. You put a, you guys used the Vive in some of yours, so great. You put a Vive on someone, and after 10, 15 minutes, they'll start doing this. Because it's heavy. It's top loading in that headset. You, your head starts to drop down when you're using it after a long period of time. It's a material, it's made of something. The materiality of virtual reality is, is really, really important. The, another issue that I see with people using the Vive is, especially if they're doing something particularly active, after about 10 minutes, they're about ready to kill themselves because they've wrapped the cord right around their neck three times and one more yank will really do it, you know? So the materiality of these things is something we overlook but it's a very big barrier to actually using them. Now, I talk about materiality in another sense here as well. Borrowing from Catherine Hales, the materiality of media acts as a connective tissue joining the physical and mental. So there's an element of Marshall McLuhan in there as well. What Hales is saying is that the way we interact with digital media in this case is a connection between us and the information being displayed in it. Now, in the perfect virtual reality experience, a perfect embodied state in a virtual world, our bodies would be absolutely replicated in that virtual world. What Hales is saying here is that if we were to connect the virtual and the material, when I look down, my feet would be there. My legs would be there when I move. It wouldn't just be my disembodied hands moving around. Virtual reality is not anywhere close to dealing with this yet. We, can, we talk about embodiment in virtual reality as if it's a given. It's like, I was there. You know, I've, I felt there. But actually, you just look down, you're not there. There's a big void where your body should be, and it's kind of disconcerting as well at times. Now, this isn't a huge issue in certain virtual reality experiences. For example, I can't imagine it was a huge issue in yours, gents, because you have an activity-driven model in that which is not focused on the body itself, but it is focused on certain bodily movements, but it matches with what they would be doing normally. But in other virtual envir environments where you're asked to move around, for example, it can be quite disconcerting to move with no legs. And that can actually trigger feelings of, and waves of nausea in you when you start thinking, hang on, my legs aren't there and they're not moving here. What's going on? Oh, God, I've got a you know, disconnect between mind and body here now. This is really, really, really sick making sometimes. So, materiality is a serious issue. We've still got large and heavy uh, head-mounted displays. Now, there are lighter and more comfortable headsets being developed, but this is a continuum. It's going to take time before these filter through, still. Wireless connections are beginning to replace tethered connections. We see the Oculus Go. Here's a great example of a wireless connection, but it's not quite got the same efficacy and the same power as a machine yet. Um, and there are promises of uh, Oculus that they're going to make a new headset next year, which will be the same as a Rift, but it'll be wireless and so yeah, you show me that when it happens, because at the moment that would weigh several tons. Yeah, so it's not, I doubt it at the moment. This is all still being worked upon and perfected. So there's a barrier at the moment in terms of the materiality of these things. There's also a barrier in terms of the structure of virtual reality headsets. Virtual reality headset cuts you off from the world. Now, you might say, well, that's actually what we wanted to do. We want to create this kind of sensory deprivation chamber where you're 
actually embodied fully in this experience. However, it means that we don't interact with the physical world as well. Now, if we can have pass through experiences with virtual reality headsets, that would bring new contours to what we could do with them. That's all I'm arguing there. At the moment, it's an all or nothing approach. You're either in virtual reality or you're not. So you can't mix the two up. And materiality isn't just limited to headsets as well. The haptic interfaces are seriously problematic at the moment. They don't very often feel realistic. You can't use your hands like you would normally use your hands. And so, how immersive can these things be? Well, we've seen plenty of examples today of people making, I think, very reasonable claims to immersion. You know, people did feel immersed in this and felt immersed in that. However, full immersion, as in we feel like we exist in a virtual reality environment, is not possible at this point because we can't fully embody that environment. Work is being done, but it could be many, many, many years away yet. If this is not a case of simply, oh, the machines are here, then now it's going to take a couple of years to get all this perfected. Actually, haptic technologies are incredibly difficult to design. They're incredibly difficult to implement. And they t you know, the people have been working on these problems since the 1980s. It's not been cracked. It's a long way from being cracked at this point. And so because of that, translating the body into virtual reality is problematic. And you think, OK. So what's the point of that? What is exactly the point of all that discussion? Well, if you can't translate a body into virtual reality, what exactly are you when you're in virtual reality? You are a particular notion of a body. The virtual reality experience designer has a concept of a body which you are being asked to fulfill. Virtual reality designers, by and large, as we've seen today, are white men between the ages of 25 and 45. Was under 45, you see, Mike. Buy me that beer later. Now, you might ask, okay, so what's the problem with that? Well, ask any of my colleagues who discuss feminism, for example, what might be an issue with that. There is a significant issue with how embodiment is actually conceptualized in these virtual worlds. There is an assumption that we are a particular kind of thing, that we occupy space in a particular way, that we have particular mobilities, that we have a particular height, that we have a particular build. And these are all translated into our experiences. Our, experience, our experiences in virtual reality are mediated through these expectations of the, the creation of virtual bodies. So if you can't mop, m map in your actual body in it, you're occupying the body as it is thought of by someone else. That is problematic. It may not be hugely problematic for everything. I don't think it's a massive impact on the work you're doing. However, for a range of other experiences, this could be very, very telling. So the inability to render the body, the cumbersomeness of some of the products, these are all problematic aspects. And they're things which a lot of people don't consider. But the people that I interviewed for this research did actually consider in some depth. Interfaces is interesting. Because this is a barrier to use in HE, which again resonates somewhat with what I've just said about one of the aspects of materiality. Digital interfaces one encounters in virtual reality are largely based on the interfaces you would see in gaming technologies and in gaming media. Drop-down menus which are triggered by the use of a trigger handset, for example. If you look at the Oculus home screen on the go, that's a classical gaming environment being rendered in virtual reality. Okay, what's the problem with that then? Well, gaming environments are wonderful for people like me who spend most of their free time playing games. Great, I'm used to gaming environments. I've been using them for years. That isn't everyone in the population by any means. Gaming environments are not intuitive. There's something that has to be learned. We become accustomed to, we become socialized to as we play games. For 
the large, for the majority of the population who don't play games for leisure of that kind, gaming environments need to be learned. The interface needs to be learned as well. Therefore, virtual reality isn't intuitive for everyone. It's fine for me. I can just sit in. I know what's going on. At the same way that, you know, if there's an alien invasion tomorrow, I know what to do. Because I've been doing it since forever. Like, you know, I jump in my spaceship and blow them all away. I've been doing that. You know, I'd be, I'd be awesome. For zombies, no problem. You know? But for lots of people who aren't socialised in video games, this becomes a significant issue. And there is, again, an inborn in assumption here that people will grasp this intuitively. And when we're deploying virtual reality in educational environments, we are also sometimes making an assumption that people will know and implicitly understand what this is and how we're supposed to interact with it. But that's a very dangerous assumption to use. The dominance of game style interfaces is something that needs close attention. And it's an indication as well that many people who design for VR come from gaming backgrounds. So they use what they know. The primary design engine for virtual reality is Unity. That's a gaming engine. Virtual reality is built in a gaming environment. Now, so you can see why game interfaces are so popular. However, within that, there's all sorts of assumptions about who is going to be using this. So, Jaron Lanier's 2017 book, The Dawn of the New Everything, makes a very big deal of this. That the absorption of other media into virtual reality is actually one of the big things that goes for virtual reality. It's a big plus point for virtual reality. It's something virtual reality's got going for it. However, if virtual reality doesn't develop its own interfaces, its own style, its own way of doing things, we're going to start alienating people. People are going to look at it and think, well, this is just a video game, and I don't play video games. I don't like video games. Video games aren't for me. We don't want that, especially if we're deploying it in higher education. The language of virtual reality is more problematic. And this is a very strange argument, so bear with me. It's borrowed from Lanier, but it's backed up by a lot of the research that I did last year. Virtual reality has a problem of communication. We can't articulate what virtual reality does without relying on terms that we borrow from other media. So when we're t I've just talked for five minutes about video games ostensibly in virtual reality. This is exactly the point that Lanier is making in his book and what a lot of my participants made last year. We don't have a language of virtual reality. We don't have a, a discourse and a way of describing things in virtual reality without saying, it's like playing this game. It's like watching this. It's like having this. It's like having that. There's no way, virtual reality, I feel like, hasn't been translated to have its own discourse at the moment. Now, you might think, okay, well, what's the problem with that? I mean, I don't really get why that's an issue. Obviously, surely that must make it easier to understand. Well, if you look at uh, Lev Manovich's language of new media, what Manovich said is that when new media technologies came along in the 90s, they developed a whole new discourse about things which made their success and their use easy to understand. People had a new language to understand things. When you said you Google something, you know what it is instinctively. Do we have the same kind of terminology to describe experiences in virtual reality? The argument made by all my part, well, not all, but by most of my participants was no. It's very hard to articulate what you can do in virtual reality. And that's kind of the main point about this barrier to a virtual reality. The difficulty of translating virtual reality experiences is really problematic when we're trying to communicate outside of virtual reality with people. So developers talking to people who have concepts have, very, have great difficulty in matching up ideas. And we had an example earlier today uh, in Lorna's talk this morning where she was saying that she worked with an outside company to develop a virtual reality experience and what they designed was not what she wanted. So this is a disconnect between the language used 
to describe what you want in virtual reality and what you can do in virtual reality. And we haven't bridged the gap between them yet. We haven't got a, a bridge between these two different conceptual fields. So what that means is that a lot of virtual reality stuff is not articulated well and therefore is not implemented well because we haven't bridged this gap between design principles and actual desires of what you want in the virtual environment. Now in education, that's going to be significantly problematic. Not only will we as educators have problems telling people who are involved in virtual reality what we want, how are we supposed to articulate educational benefits to our students if we can't articulate what this is? What am I supposed to say? Am I supposed to say, I'm going to put this thing on you and it's, it's going to be amazing. amazing. Um, well, you, well you, okay, you know, um, that, that, that would sell it to me, but then it's not going to sell it to any sort of self-discerning student who's paying £9,000 a year for the experience. So, the language of virtual reality is a significant issue. By the way, I'm using a lot of um, references in this slide. I don't have a bibliography at the end, but you can buy my book. There's a, there's a huge bibliography in there. There's like 200 references in there. Cyber sickness is something which we have discussed around today a little. What I want to draw attention to with cyber sickness in particular is how it is not equally distributed. Women are more susceptible to cyber sickness than men. And there is empirical research which supports this. Indeed, much of the empirical research shows that this imbalance is due to deep, hardwired perceptual, difference, perceptual system differences between men and women. In short, men rely on parallax and parallax movements in order to perceive depth. Women rely on color and shading. Virtual reality experiences, by and large, are designed by men and tested by men. And their market is men. And their depth perceptual cues are parallax cues. <laughs> and there is far more likelihood of women feeling ill in a virtual reality environment than there is a man. And this is hugely problematic if we are going to roll this out in a, in a higher education context. Now, if you happen to teach a course where 95% of people are men on that course, you're still in trouble because there is legislation that says, you know, you've got to treat everyone equally. Now, this isn't a, an explicit design bias. These are implicit biases, but they're things that we do need to take into account if we are to have equality of provision, for example. So the final one is cost. Now, we've had some discussions today, and I think, Michael, and your talk earlier was good on cost. You showed that range of different cost options. One thing I'd like to say about the Google Cardboard is, um, yes, it's a low cost uh, VR thing, but it does require 500 quid worth of phone. Um, you know, not everyone has one of these. They are kind of ubiquitous, but not fully ubiquitous. The most common barrier identified by my participants was cost. Of course, the Oculus Rift now retails for what, 350 pounds, I think, out of the box, but you need a computer rig of nearly £2,000 to run it on. So it's not quite a... Some of them say, oh, well, the costs are coming down. Well, until computer costs come down, and until, importantly, graphics card costs come radically down, these are still going to be expensive options. Now, that leads us into a certain trade-off. Do we design lots of virtual reality experiences in HE for the lower-cost options? which is a trade-off in terms of quality and in terms of processing power. You couldn't do the kind of CAD design work that you were doing using Google Cardboard. It's just not possible to do that. So we have to, do we limit what we do, or do we invest lots in very expensive computer equipment, which, let's be fair, will be obsolete in four or five years' time, when the next generation of headsets and the next generation of headsets after that come along and replace them. This is a very difficult trade-off that we've got to make as VR emerges. Are we to say to our institutions, you bear the costs of students using virtual reality because I know I'm talking in my institution here, but I know what my institution would say if I asked for 200 virtual reality headsets. There would be a very short answer of two words and I'm not going to repeat it now. Or 
do we say, well, we're going to take the low-cost option here, but we're going to limit the kind of interactions we can have in virtual reality. We're going to limit the possibilities of immersion because we're not going to take up embodiment, even though it's only in development, and so on and so forth. So cost is a major issue, which we're still struggling with. Cost will answer questions about whether virtual reality remains on-site or off-site. You know, as the Oculus Go is £200. It's a great little headset. It works fantastically. £200 is £200. And let's not forget, in this day and age, with student finances in the way they are, £200 is a hell of a lot of money for a lot of undergraduate students that they simply don't have. £200 on something like that could be the difference between rent one month and the next. So we do have to ask difficult questions about costs until the costs come radically down, which they, I'm sure they will in time, but time again. We're always sort of trying to wait to catch up here. So, I don't want to put a massive downer on things. <laughs> Virtual reality is incredibly exciting. I wouldn't have spent the last year and a half researching and writing a book on it if I didn't think there was something very, very important going on here. What I'd say is virtual reality is incredibly exciting, but it's not quite here yet. There's a little bit further to go. We need to see reductions in cost. We need to see developments in virtual reality technologies, especially with regards to how the systems work for women. We need to see better haptic interfaces so people can actually get fully immersed in them, and so on and so forth. We need to overcome some of these barriers. Now, it's an easy thing to say time will fix this, I don't think time does fix this. What will fix it is creating more virtual reality, smoothing out the edges, pushing the boundaries as far as they can go to push innovation further. And I think HG's got a massive role to play in that. However, we, don't, we need to get working on it. We need to all start developing things so we can push this further and get these kinks ironed out so it can actually be the medium that we want it to be, because it's not quite the medium that we want it to be yet. Thank you very much. It was pretty negative. No, 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 this is perfect. Because a lot of the talks we've had today have been around trying to explore what the technological benefits are. Yeah. Do you think the two sort of go hand in hand? So while we're exploring what the education benefits are with the technology we've got, and the technology is gradually improving, the costs are coming down, yeah. those two will hopefully go... I think there's going to be a, com there's a convergence based on use. Yeah. The more virtual reality is used, and the more people... Um, see positive use cases for it, the more that will drive the market to push the price down. You know, as more people are investing in it, the costs will come down over time. It's exciting to see virtual reality being used in universities and schools and colleges, as, as you noted, because that kind, it's not been a market previously. It's not been a market for the technology previously, and it's inevitably going to drive sales up, and, and that will bring unit costs down. How quickly that happens, uh, though I'm not quite sure, because there is still a lot of technological work that needs to go into these systems yet, and there's a, still a lot of investment. The good thing is, um, there's th that investment will happen. You know, Facebook are investing heavily, Google are investing heavily. They wouldn't be betting on you know, horses that they knew were going to fail at the first hurdle. The bad part of that is, it's Google and Facebook who are doing the investment, so you make of that. That's chapter three. Um, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be the only interface, but I think it's going to be the major one in terms of consumer VR. Now, I don't think educational VR has to go down that road, but something needs to happen quickly. Uh, otherwise, it is going to be, it, it, it's largely going to be Facebook space, and, we, you know, a cursory glance at any newspaper this year will tell you what Facebook does with things at the moment. And um, 
what we're doing with virtual reality is saying, well, you've got all our data already about what we do online. Here's what our eyes do, you know, uh, and as we go further, here's what, you know, our heart is doing and, set, and you know, the biofeedback loop is going to be huge. There needs to be some kind of, I think commercial VR is going to be Facebook's, but I don't think educational VR needs to be that way. Although Facebook are now, Facebook slash Oculus are now rolling out free, <laughs> free educational packages for universities in Japan, Seattle, uh, there was another place as well. They're starting to roll them out all over the place. I'm actually quite excited to get my hands on to see if they're any good, but I also recognize it's Facebook as well. Yeah. I understand what you mean. Um, it, there is a risk of doing that, but I think there's enough innovative work going on around the fringes of virtual reality that that's not going to be a danger at the moment. So most of the people I interviewed, when, all but one, I'd say, of the people I interviewed for this project were independent developers. And they are genuinely trying to lift the lid on this technology and see what it can do and push it further and even modify it and you know homebrew equipment for these things that will improve things going on there's still enough of that community going on yet it's not homogenized to the extent that it's but i suspect that's not a heck of a long way away and that follows the development of a lot of a lot of technological a lot of mediums over time the internet was a great homebrew uh, homebrew success story until the mid 2000s and then We've got four companies running the whole thing now, basically. So if there is a risk that we'll go down that road, but I, I don't think we're there yet. But it's something that has to be guarded against. And I think that means educational institutions investing in this in a big way, you know, to make sure that doesn't happen, to have independent development of virtual reality resources within education is very, very important.